This is the L3 Leadership Podcast, episode number 128. What's up, everybody, and welcome to episode number 128 of the L3 Leadership Podcast. My name is Doug Smith, and I'm the founder of L3 Leadership. We are a leadership development company devoted to helping you become the best leader that you can be. In this episode, you're going to get to hear my friend TJ Christensen speak. He is the Executive Vice President of Sales and Marketing at Accesso, and I've known TJ for four or five years now, and he's been a huge part of my life in L3, and I've been consistently over the years impressed with his leadership, his insight, and just him as a person, and so I know that you're going to love this talk. The title of his talk is uh, Becoming the Obvious Choice, which I just love the title of that. And in this talk, he shares five keys to becoming the obvious choice for for promotion in your company. And I really think this will add a lot of value. If you enjoy this talk, we also recorded the Q&A session we had with TJ um, at the breakfast. And uh, you can listen to that in episode number 129 of the L3 Leadership Podcast. If you want to connect with TJ uh, and learn more about him, you can go to l3leadership.com org forward slash episode 128 and you will find everything that you need right there. I will say uh, in this podcast, uh, uh, TJ does talk a little bit about L3 leadership and the impact it's had on his life. And I do want to encourage you as we start out the new year in 2017, um, if you're interested in connecting with us, we would love to see you come to one of our events uh, and join a mastermind group. We really believe that those two things will help ca- will help catapult your growth as a leader. And so uh, if you're interested in either of those, just go to our website and you'll see uh, the tabs for both events and mastermind groups. And we encourage you to get involved. If you're new to this podcast, we're committed to bring you three or four episodes every single month to help you grow your leadership skills. Uh, So we hope that you'll subscribe. And if you've been listening to us for a while, we'd really appreciate if you would not only subscribe, but also leave a rating and review on iTunes, Stitcher, or whatever you use to listen to that. One last thing before we jump into TJ's talk, I want to thank our sponsors, Bab Inc. Um, They are an insurance broker and third-party administrator and consulting firm in Pennsylvania and all across the country. They're led by my friend Russell Livingston, and they have a huge passion for developing next-generation leaders, um, which is why they partner with us and they host all of our monthly leadership breakfasts. So if your company has any insurance needs, check them out at babbins.com. That's B-A-B-B-I-N-S.com, and you can find out all the cool work that they're doing. With that being said, let's just jump right right into TJ's talk, and I'll be back at the end with a few announcements. All right. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you guys for coming. Uh, I was driving here. It was like four degrees in my car, so you guys get a star because that is brutal. Um, so thanks for spending your time with me this morning. Um, as uh, Chris mentioned, my name is TJ Christensen. I'm the executive vice president of sales and marketing for a company called Excesso. Um, and before we get into the content and, and, and the talk, I thought it would be... Um, uh, I thought it would be valuable for, for me to share a little bit about my background and my journey and ha- how it relates to sort of the talk that we're going to get into. So, um, so I, I work for a company called Accesso. Um, at Accesso, we believe that technology has a power to redefine the guest experience, and how we do that is through providing innovative ticketing and queuing solutions for attractions around the world. So museums, theme parks, uh, cultural venues, zoos, aquariums, uh, live entertainment venues, those are all our clients that, that we serve. Um, and as Chris mentioned, when I started with the company, um, we were a, a small organization out of Orlando, Florida. Um, uh, first, to just rewind. So I, I've been in, I'm a transplant to Pittsburgh. I've been here uh, just under or just over five years. Um, I came here by way of Florida, which is usually the backwards way. Everyone goes south instead of north. Um, but my wife is from here. We wanted to move back to uh, be closer to family. Um, and we did that, and it's been awesome. It's been a great five years, and we have no plans to go anywhere else. Um, and uh, so fast forward to Excesso. So I was in Orlando for 10 years, and um, I've been with Excesso for, uh, it'll be eight in April. <clears throat> and when, um, when I started with Excesso, we were like, you know, a small group of people in a room, probably about this size, kind of like, we're really going to do something like we can, we can change the industry. Um, and, uh, we had, we had this technology that was really great. Um, and, <coughs> and over the course of, of time, um, we were able to grow that organization. We were acquired, and we've su- since acquired uh, two other companies. And now are, we have over 1,000 venues that we serve around the globe. And we have, uh, as Chris mentioned, about 350 employees uh, worldwide and are pr- arguably the one, or two, the, the one or two largest 
second or third largest ticketing provider in the world behind like Ticketmaster. Um, so a lot of people haven't heard from us, but we are, you know, in the ticketing industry, we are, um, we're, we're, we're pretty big. Um, but, but my journey didn't start there by any means. Um, I, uh, I grew up in Delaware. Uh, I'm a graduate of the University of Delaware, so go Blue Hens. Um, <laughs> And uh, so I, I grew up in Delaware, and, and I did two, two things while I was in college that, were, that were, I would say were right. Um, and the first one was that I graduated. Um, and the, uh, the second one was that my sophomore year, I participated in the uh, Walt Disney World College program. So what that allowed me to do was take a semester off, go to Florida, and work for Disney in a frontline job. So I worked at the Disney, the Disney MGM Studios, which is now the Hollywood Studios. Uh, I worked in the parking lot. So I was in full yellow regalia, driving the tram, spieling on the back, waving traffic in. I did that for six months, and it was a blast. And what that did... Uh, that time spent there is really sort of sparked uh, an interest and a love for attractions and hotels and resorts uh, in me. Um, and upon graduating from University of Delaware, I took the chance to go back. Um, and I participated in, a, in um, a professional internship with the sales and marketing group at Walt Disney World. Um, my glamorous internship was driving uh, a wrapped van around Orlando. Um, so it could have been a character, could have been a an exhibit or attraction that they were featuring. Mine was the Who Wants to Be a Millionaire attraction. Uh, I drove that around Orlando and dropped off brochures at hotels and concierge desks and talked to them about Disney product and, you know, just shooting the breeze with them. That's how I started my career. Um, I spent a total of about four and a half years with Disney and, um, and, uh, and, and sort of grew up in many ways in that organization. And, and Disney's really well known for, for their leadership development. And as a salaried employee or a manager within Walt Disney World, you go through a core set of, of trainings called Foundations, um, where they teach you about all sorts of things that sort of entry-level managers should know. Uh, so I was able to take care of that. But one of the really cool things that I was able to participate in is they had a leadership summit where they brought in all the top leaders of the, of the company, and they gave talks. And one of the talks that I went to was by this guy named Brad Rex. He ran Epcot uh, at the time. He's since left Disney and does consulting. But um, Brad Rex gave a talk called The Obvious Choice. Um, and it had a really profound effect on me and the way that I approached my work. So profound, I can't remember the actual <laughs> content aside from the title. Um, but all these years later, it, it still resonates with me. And, 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 it, and it had me... Walking away from that, I approached my work differently, and I, I thought about how I was engaging with my coworkers, how I was engaging with my work, and all these different things um, that helped me sort of, sort of develop as, as, as a contributor to my, to my department. Um, and my hope today is that um, I'm going to basically repurpose the title and, and provide you what, what I think are like five tips of becoming the obvious choice to me. Um, and the difference between being a choice and the obvious choice is when there's a role um, or there's, there's something that you're up for, whether it's a promotion at work or job change or something like that, um, it's, uh, you know, there's, oh, you know, TJ's interested in this job, too, that just posted. And there's, you know who would be great for this job is TJ. That's the obvious choice. So what we're going to walk through are what I think are five basic things that at the end of this are sort of like a checklist, that if you run through these five things and you do an honest self-assessment, looking yourself in the mirror, and if you can tick the boxes on all five of those, guess what? You're probably a rock star. Um, if, if, but also, if you can't honestly check all five of those, that's okay. Guess what? You've got a roadmap to get better. Um, so that's my hope for you today as we, as we get through the content. So jumping right in, the first one is you've got to be great where you are. You know, <clears throat> if, you are a, if you work at a restaurant as a dishwasher and you aspire to be the head chef someday, and uh, you, you're not going to get there by every shift sort of peering across the line with longing eyes, hoping that they see you looking at them and being like, hey, why don't you come over and help out? What you've got to do is you've got to be the best dishwasher you can be. You've got to, you've got to be the best dishwasher that that, uh, that restaurant or that organization has ever seen. And you've also got to find ways to contribute in and ab above and beyond what your current role is. So in this example, that could be coming in early and helping with line prep. All those sorts of things add up and, and show excellence in your role and, and, your, and your willingness to contribute to the greater good. Um, in my experience... When I first started out, when I, when I f latched onto Disney full-time, um, I started off as a coordinator. And, and one of the things that I did is I tried to, to really pour into my role and understand everything that I could about that job. 
Um, and then once I had that and I felt like I was, I was working and that took time. Once I felt like I was working at a high level with my current roles and responsibilities, I, I picked my head up a little bit and I tried to figure out how I could add value within the realm of my role to contribute to what we were trying to do. And, and what I did is I found, you know, in pa- I, I listened really intently. And, and as people would say stuff in passing that they maybe didn't have time to do or, hey, someone should actually take a look at this stuff, but they never assigned the task out to, I did it. I put it on my task list. And then when I had an opportunity and I had it prepared, I'd go and say, hey, you know, we were talking about this a couple of months ago. I actually looked did, did some work on it. And this is what I think. And this is what I think we should do. And sometimes I was really off base. But what I did do was showed initiative, and I showed the ability to think independently and contribute, um, and and that was and that was a direct um, that was a direct result of me being being the best I could be where I was. Um, I also made sure that I, I shared my aspirations of what I wanted to grow into too, because you want to do that. But if you walk into a role and the first thing you're doing is is eyeing the next role, you're not going to be successful. You've got to have excellence where you are today. <clears throat> the next one is eagle or a duck. So, like, I have a, I have a four year old and a one and a half year old, and I can bet you when these guys are teenagers, they're gonna walk around the house being like, "You mean an eagle or a duck?" And eagle, because I say this all the time, um, and I, and I, I stole it from a lot of things that I do. I steal from people, uh, like, because I think they're great ideas. I steal ideas. Um, and I had a coworker that would always talk about, "Are you are you gonna be an eagle or a duck for me?" And an eagle when presented with a problem or task, soars above and gets it done. Um, a duck waddles around and quacks about the problem. So are you an eagle or an, a duck within, within your organization? Um, there is nothing more satisfying as a leader than <clears throat> having a one-on-one or a catch-up with someone and they talk to you about deliver. There's a big delivery, right? There, there's some sort of project they've been working on or, or something like that. And, and unbeknownst to you, there was this huge issue and they rallied a team of people to overcome the issue or they creatively problem solved and the outcome was maybe a little different and maybe even a little bit better, but they didn't, they they took, they were, they felt empowered and they felt um, that they had enough ownership to be able to soar above and solve that problem on their own. Um, And that is 100% a way to become the obvious choice. And what I would encourage you to do is think really hard about eagle and duck situations in your life, um, professionally, personally, all of those things. And those things can help you overcome experience gaps. If I'm looking to hire someone and I've had hands-on experience with them showing, exhibiting eagle behavior on a consistent basis, and, <clears throat> but they're not 100% fit on the experience side, I'm going to hire that person 10 out of 10 times over someone that's a, that's a, that's a good fit on paper for, for experience. So you know, think really hard about situations. And, and when, you're, when, when you're in something where there's, oh, oh boy, what am I going to do? Be an eagle. Punch through that wall, um, you know, and, and, and get it done. The third thing is communicate effectively. So uh, I love this image because it's clearly people that have not communicated on a plan. It's uh, for those on the podcast, it's a bridge that does not meet in the middle um, <clears throat> and uh, would be a huge problem. And I would not want to be the contractor there. Um, so we live in a world that is 24 seven, right? We've all got these wonderful devices in our pockets um, that make emailing super easy, text messaging super easy. Um, and by making it easy, it also, it's easy by definition because it's quick. And when we're quick, we're short. Um, and controlling your tone in communication is incredibly important. What you can control is your tone. What you can't control are the attitudes, the beliefs, the day or morning that I've had and projecting upon my email. And I've fallen, I I have, I have sent emails too quickly before, and I can think of two instances in my career specifically where it did not, it wasn't great, Um, where I didn't take enough care and enough time to really hone in my tone on on an email. And in written communication, it is so, so important. Um, So what I encourage, uh, what I I encourage my team to do and and anybody to do is when you have an an important email or an important communication that you need to get out is one, um, take time to write it and send it to a coworker, a friend, a colleague, someone, and have them review it for tone. 
I do this all the time. I have probably four or five people in my organization that, or, or my wife um, that I'll say, hey, can you read this email for me? Like, this is what I'm trying to get across, but I'm just, there's this one section that I'm a little worried about that could be misinterpreted. Um, and it's not about the result. It's about the, it, it is about, it's not the content of the message. It is the tone of the message. Um, and, you know, and getting that feedback and soliciting that feedback makes you a better writer and a better communicator. So I would really encourage you in, 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 in the world that we live in today is take time on tone of your email and you'll get better and better. There's two ways to say, you know, I'm in sales. If someone's trying to sell you something, there's two ways to say you're not interested. There's one is, you know, hey, you know, that's a that's. That's a fantastic product. It sounds like you guys are, you know, you can, you could add a lot of value. However, you know, we're, that's not really the best time for us or, or we're not interested or wouldn't be a good fit. There's also get out of my office, right? You're saying the same thing. The way you're communicating and the tone in which you're communicating that are completely different. So take time um, to talk about your tone. The second thing about communication is um, you know, at the end of the day, we all have to deliver. We have to deliver something, whether it's service or a product or, 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 or something, results. Um, and, and hitting expectations on a consistent basis is really important. So if you have a deadline at work and something comes up, you need to communicate the changes to that deadline as soon as possible. If something's due at 3 o'clock on a Friday and you're letting your boss know at 2.50 that you're not going to get it to him at 3, you failed. Um, you probably knew at 9 a.m. in the morning you weren't going to hit 3 o'clock. You might have even known on Thursday. you got to be honest and forthright about when you're not going to hit those deadlines and you need to communicate it. And when you need to push a deadline, it's okay. A lot of times it's okay to move the deadline. Um, but when you recommunicate the deadline, communicate it once and make sure you hit the second one. Um, so give yourself buffer, give yourself those things, but also make sure that you're communicating on how you're pacing through what you need to pace through, um, and explaining it. And, and by the way, um, if at 250, you're not doing it because you hadn't thought about it until 250, that's more of a coaching opportunity for you to think about than, than a communication of the deadline. Right. So, so just think about that with, with regard to communication and, and making sure that makes sure that, that, that ensures that you're all on the right page and you're all heading in the same direction, um, in both cases. The next one is learn to work hard. So learning to work hard is hard work. Um, it's really hard. Uh, at Excesso, I work with the hardest, the, it's the hardest working group of individuals I've ever had the privilege to be associated with, hands down. Um, we have a lot of fun. We, we work in a great industry, as Chris can attest to. It, or attest to. Um, but we are a very driven organization, and we work hard. Um, and it's, it's a process to get there. Um, you know, when I, I think about early on in my career, I used to have a manager, a mentor um, that was from Long Island. Uh, that I, I, I try to uh, sort of do his accent, but I can't do it that well. But um, he, uh, <clears throat> at like 2 or 3 o'clock, 3 or 4 o'clock on a Friday, like when I was out of college, um, we'd be in meetings. It'd just be him and I talking about what's coming up for the next week. He'd be like, you're done. You're done. This is over. You're done. Your eyes are glazed over. It's not worth doing the conversation. Like, you know, just go answer email and finish your day. Because I didn't have the endurance. I didn't know how to work. I, I didn't know how to work as hard as he could work a full week. Um, and by Friday at like 3 o'clock, I was spent. Um, and one of the breakthroughs for me was he, he, he also got me into running. Um, I had never run before. I had run playing soccer and stuff like that, but I'd never really, like, really run. Um, the most I'd ever run was like three miles. And um, I thought running six miles was impossible. I thought I was one of those people that like physically, like it was never going to happen. Um, and, you know, he got me into a training plan. He was a big runner. And, and we were, we, we started running. And slowly but surely, you start doing this training plan. And then, you know, you're halfway through your marathon training plan. And you're talking to a coworker about how you're feeling a little tight today because you ran 13 miles before work. And, you know, your long run is only 16 miles this weekend. I mean, you know, so, so coming from someone that has never run three miles before to be able to have those types of conversations, you're able to punch through those things and, and, and sort of understand that your abilities are, are above and beyond what, what you think they are. And everybody sort of operates with like an invisible barrier around them of, of, of level of comfort. And what you've got to get used to is working and, and pushing that barrier out a little bit and, and get comfortable being uncomfortable. 
um, and working really hard. And, and it, it's, a t it's a process. It's just like the first time you run six miles, you go home and you collapse on your bed. And you think you're, you're never going to make it. And then, you know, two or three months later, you're running 16 miles, no problem. I mean, it, it takes time and it takes diligence, but you've got to work. You've got to work hard at learning how to work hard. Um, um, so, you know, that, that invisible barrier, and it's not, it's not necessarily, I'm not saying that like, hey, everybody, the recipe for success is, you know, work 70 hours a week and you'll be successful. That's not, that's not the message. But there are times in your life that if you want to achieve certain things, you're going to have to work outside of your, com your comfort zone. If you need to go back to school to get your associate's degree or your master's degree or something like that and do your, and work full time, that might mean that while you're going back to school, the only time that you have to study or read up on or catch up on stuff is you got to wake up at five in the morning and just take that time. And, and, it, it, and it is uncomfortable and you're going to you know, suffer from lack of sleep and things like that. But th it's those hardships that push that barrier out. So the next time you're f hit with an obstacle, you're like, oh, this is no problem. Running six miles is no problem. You know, it, it, that, that's you got to learn to work hard. And the last one um, is you got to invest in yourself. And everybody here absolutely gets a check plus because it's freezing cold outside and you're here. Um, and, you know, you were clearly interested. You, you, hopefully I provided some value, but you were interested in getting some values that, that you, could, you could apply in your lives um, by showing up here today. So there's kind of two ways that I think about investing in yourself. One is you take it on yourself and you, you know, you're listening to podcasts um, and you're, uh, reading books, maybe you're taking some classes, um, things like that that you can do to better yourself. The second thing is surrounding yourself by great w with great people. And I was really fortunate or, early in my career, right out of college, I fell into uh, uh, I fell into a group of guys where we were all career focused, um, and we we not intentionally, but we all we because we were all career focused, we were all helping each other through challenges or how to get promotions or position ourselves or to become the obvious choice um, and sharing best practices and, and things like that. And, um, and, and that really helped me grow up in addition to meeting my wife and help, having her help me grow up, uh, really helped me sort of fo laser in focus on, okay, here's what your, and, and understanding what your actual, what your aptitude was and, and what your, what your trajectory could be. Um, and so you've got to surround yourself with great people. And here at L3, I, I can't think of a better place to do it. Um, you know, I've been involved with L3 um, for, I guess, three years now. And to, to, to think back and reflect on, you know, the lessons that I've learned over the last three years that are directly a result of either coming to these breakfasts, listening to podcasts, or participating in the mastermind groups uh, has been immensely impactful in my life and in all aspects of my life. And being able to show up to a mastermind group um, and pour into other people, but also have them pour into you is amazing. Um, and, and you are the average of your peers. So take a look to your left and your right. And if you're in, in all aspects of your life, if, 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 if you're not seeing what you like, then you've got to make some changes and you've got to make sure that you're surrounding yourself with people that are contributing and driving and pushing you. Um, and if you make that investment, I promise you, you will achieve all sorts of great things in your life and, and you'll live a life of fulfillment. Um, you know, and, and sort of the final, the final point I'll make here before we, we get into the, the sort of wrapping up is, you know, hard work doesn't equal success. Um, you know, it, it doesn't. Uh, hard work equals fulfillment. Hard work equals being able to go home, uh, rest your head on your pillow, and get a sound night's sleep. Um, if hard work equals success, all the people that that in developing countries that are that are walking three, five, ten miles to get a jug of water and bringing that back, guess what? They would be successful in in the world's definition of success. I stole that from a podcast borrowed. Um, uh, um, and I thought it was really that. that like really resonated with me. Like, you know, if, if, if karma is karma, then those people would have all the riches in the world because they are truly working hard to survive, let alone anything else. So when you think about it, and if you're getting frustrated with, you know, the progress that you're making, or you're not moving fast enough, or my friend's doing this or that, you know, work your plan, you know, run through the checklist, work your plan, and, and really do some self-assessment on, are you working as hard as you can? Are you being present in your current role? Are you, um, are you being a duck or an eagle? And are you effectively communicating? 
Um, those are all things that, that you're going to need to be successful and, and, and go from that, um, you know, oh, hey, yeah, TJ is interested in this job too, to, you know, who would be fantastic in this role is TJ. Or, you know, who we need to think about as far as like a star and, and getting to, to get to a leadership level or, or get more responsibility is TJ. Those are things that, that, that are going to separate yourself from the pack. Um, so I actually missed my slide, but anyways, so be great where you are, eagle or duck, communicate effectively, work hard, and invest in yourself. Um, and like I said, if you're able to, to, to say with confidence that you're doing all five of those things, then guess what? You're probably a rock star in your organization. Um, if there's one of those things that you're not necessarily so great at, guess what? You've got something to work on for 2017. You know, and you can be proactive in that. You can own it. Um, it's really up to you. Um, so that, that sort of concludes our time together on, on the talk portion. I'd love to open it up for Q&A. Um, so thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for listening to TJ's talk on how to become the obvious choice. I really hope you enjoyed it. But more importantly, I hope that you apply it. Um, you can find ways to connect with TJ and what he's doing again at l3leadership.org forward slash episode 128. And uh, his talk didn't stop there. We had a question and answer session with TJ. And if you'd like to listen to that, you can listen to it in episode 129 of the podcast. Again, I encourage you, if you're interested in L3 leadership, uh, really get on our website. Um, you can join a mastermind group. You can attend one of our events. Uh, there's lots of ways to plug in. Just go to l3leadership.org. And uh, when you subscribe to our email list, you'll not only stay up to date with what we're doing, you'll also get a free copy of my ebook, Making the Most of Mentoring, which is my step-by-step -step process for how I get meetings with leaders. Again, if you appreciated the podcast, I'd really appreciate it if you would subscribe to it and leave a rating and review. It really helps us grow the podcast audience. Thank you for that. And as always, I like to end with a quote. And John Paul Warren said this. He said, every great leader can take you back to a defining moment when they decided to lead. And maybe you've had that moment in your life. Maybe you haven't. But I just want to encourage you, hey, step up and lead. Make the decision every day to wake up and lead. It's going to make the world a better place. Thanks for listening and being a part of L3 Leadership. My wife, Laura, and I appreciate you. And we hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you.